Yeah, welcome in, uh, for the second day. I hope uh, you slept well. And this talk will be about um, how to use uh, open source techniques to collaborate together for coding and stuff uh, in a bigger environment, as far as I understand it. Yeah. And um, Isabel Drost form will speak. <laughs> we'll speak about inner source, open source collaborations, patterns beyond public force projects. Right. Have fun. Good morning. Great that you made it here. Um, so this is about open source collaboration patterns beyond public open, um, free and open source software projects. So it is within enterprise, um, within close source development, like how do I scale what's typically known as agile towards bigger teams. So how come I said I'm telling you something about that? I'm open source strategist at this company, Europace. Going to go into a little bit more deep detail what we do later on. I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation um, and created a couple uh, projects and conferences. So what is Europace? Uh, Europace's mission is to connect finance and people. So anyone of you who lives in Germany and has purchased a house or flat and needed financing and a loan for that, you may have heard about um, independent vendors where you can get that. The engines that does the loan comparison, so it's usually done by Europace. So essentially connecting um, those who are providing loans and those who are distributing to the, 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 them to the end user um, and creating a marketplace on that. Why are they interested in something like InnerSource, like bringing open source development to the company? They believe that good ideas essentially can come from everywhere. Um, they believe that people working on software should have a purpose. Um, they believe that soft, uh, teams should be self-organizing and should be held. There should be a sense of accountability. Of course, we are hiring, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to tell you about the challenges. Why they have been looking into rolling out or like getting inspiration from how open source pro uh, projects collaborate. So, what are the challenges? One of the things, Europace is located in Berlin, in Germany, and they are trying to grow, but they are trying to grow such that they can um, have um, people come to the teams and collaborate remotely. We've got people in Cologne, we've got people in Hamburg, or more like in Lübeck, who are more or less full-time remote, plus we've got several colleagues who have family. Um, we've got colleagues who come one hour um, away from Berlin. So for them, it's like an on and off remote setting. See, teams also want to scale. Um, so they wanted to get some inspiration how to make um, design decisions, some best practices on how to collaborate and how to make uh, repository is better discoverable, such that what's developed over here isn't reinvented over here, but such that there is a, a common ground in collaboration between the teams. Another challenge that they wanted to solve was they were very much um, into face-to-face -face communication, which is awesome, up until the point where you do have meetings and you want to pull in colleagues into the conversation after the meeting happened and you only have like the meeting title left. What they also wanted to achieve was to make decision making more transparent over a longer period of time. Europace was uh, founded roughly 20 years ago. Um, they've got long lived software systems. So what they wanted to figure out is how to make um, the documentation of the decisions that once were made transparent over a longer time. They also want to turn the users of their uh, platform, they want to enable them to be able to contribute back and to contribute to what they are actually using and to give them more control over that platform.
So I have an open source background. The way I know these projects is that they are very good at cross, um, building bridges, like building bridges across organizations. I know a couple of projects at Apache where cross company developers are collaborating towards a common goal. Um, the open source projects, how I know them, are very good at building bridges across time zones, continents, and cultures. And they are good at enabling those not working full time on a project to contribute and easily catch up. Plus, they are very good at building bridges across time. Think of the Apache web server. You can even today figure out what was being discussed back in 1995. So that's not an issue. So we started a little over one year ago at Europace, but InnoSource itself like, started maybe eight, uh, 10 years ago. There is one page that you can have a look at, which is InnoSourceCommons.org. Um, so the way it works is that there are people with a common interest in rolling open source collaboration models into the enterprise, collaborate there under Chatham House Rules. What does that mean? Chatham House Rules means that you can take everything you learned there, everything that was uh, set to the outside without quoting who said it. Why is that? Because if um, people are sharing their problems and their challenges there, they usually don't want to have that discussed with their company at name attached to it. There is a mixture of a Slack channel, there is a mailing list, there's patterns, um, there's regular remote meetings and two in-person meetings, one in the EU and one in the US every year. Plus there is a large collection of materials that you can learn from. Okay, how does this inner source thingy work? First step, make everything public so it's open, right? One problem you have to f solve is how do you find those projects? Well, you simply use GitHub Enterprise or uh, hosted GitHub version, everything's findable. You need a means to submit code changes to projects. So essentially put it all on GitHub and everything's good, right? Because like, well, puts transparency front and center. We translated that into a principle at Europace, which was make everything open, transparable and f transparent and findable. Essentially, codified, put everything on GitHub or whatever your um, source forge is. Except this, that's not exactly how it works. Denise Cooper, one of the um, minds behind inner source, calls it the big cheese problem. And that's something that we observed as well. So what does it look like? You have two teams, team A and team B. Team B wants to reuse what team A created. They find some issue in there. They start fixing it and they submit a pull request. What's happening at team A is, hey, this pull request doesn't follow our coding guidelines. Hey, we don't need this pull request. Hey, this is not in our prioritization chain. Suddenly everything has to be rewritten. And what happens is that team A and team B in a large company escalate to management. So suddenly you, you, are, you are back to where you were before, probably even in a worse situation. Everything's, everyone thinks that InnoSource is bullshit. So some of the things that you have to overcome is that there's different working styles. There are a lot of undocumented working um, best practices within those teams, even if you have rolled out a common coding standard across your company. There's different structures that, structures that are often not documented. When you're a new team member, you enter a mentorship phase and you learn all that. But there's no like mentorship phase for someone from another team contributing just a single patch. There's in-group talking, there's group-specific language. And on team B, what is there? There's a fear of contributing. Because suddenly um, I'm no longer in my safe team where everyone knows my little um, glitches, but I have to go to someone I pop potentially don't know. What is here? They have to integrate all that and have to take responsibility. So again, a, a, a source for fear. So some of the feedbacks that we got in our uh, retrospectives, API changes via pull requests takes ages. Pull request reviews, however, are faster after a direct ping. For those working in open source, that sounds familiar. 
You want to publish your work very early and you want to make transparent what you want to work on to get early feedback. So it's the same is true here. You want to share what you want to do early on. So there was one feedback that pull request slows work down. There was one um, feedback that, hey, at the beginning I was very skeptical. They were using Groovy and I don't like that at all. What we figured out was the um, fear for Groovy. It wasn't actually Groovy being the issue, but within the team where that um, developer came from, those people advocating for Groovy, they were tricky to deal with. But this was no longer true in the other team, so this kind of fear went away. So how do you deal with the, I don't know how these people are working? How do we do this in open source? We create a contributing document, like how to, how get, how to get started. Essentially, that's a Mikasa Isukasa uh, rule. If I'm contributing, I know that I have to accept the rules of the other one. If I'm visiting you at home, you tell me how to behave. On the other hand, if I'm visiting you, you will tell me what, what's, what kind of problems to, ex to expect. Like if you stay in my flat for a longer time, at some point I will tell you not to turn on the dishwasher and the machine for cooking water at the same time, otherwise the fuse will, um, will burn through. So what, what kind of things could you document? You could document um, community guidelines, coding conventions, testing conventions, branching conventions, commit message conventions, steps for creating good pull requests, how to submit feature requests, bug reports, etc. Do you write all of that down? Will anyone ever read that? Probably not. So the way um, we do it is, we do write a contributing document, but what we put in there is all the things where stuff fell on the floor. So every time when we we notice that something doesn't work quite well and that stops us from being productive, that is what we put in the, into this document. The way it works right now is that you open a pull request to this repository and those responsible for the code base are the ones um, setting the rules. Another um, principle is to encourage written documentation, uh, written communication. This goes right, uh, right opposed to um, what our teams have been doing before. They've been taking HL to the extreme, avoiding writing anything down, only doing face-to-face -face communication. This failed in a couple ways. First of all, you have to be in the meeting in order to understand what's going on. Second, if you're on vacation, it's very hard to catch up. Third, 10 years after you had that meeting, none of the participants, if they are still around, remembers what was being discussed there. So you're starting at essentially at point zero. Of course, this doesn't mean that meetings don't happen anymore. What you do is make a little write-up, share it with everyone. Um, what, what's the advantage of encouraging written documentation? You can pull others in after the meeting has happened. You can make visible exactly what people are working on. Um, you can enable pe people who are passively reading to become active. So we had one team working on a certain functionality and suddenly someone who was remotely interested in that topic came into the conversation and said, hey, did you think about X, Y and Z because that's also important. Nobody would ever have thought about inviting this person to all of the um, communications. Plus, you generate a baseline, like a historical archive, archive of everything that has been done, in it, which is linkable, searchable, and persistent. So essentially, we've written that down as another principle, encourage written over verbal communication. What have we observed? People were happy because it's great to discuss asynchronously and to collaborate at non-overlapping times. I mentioned before, we've got a, several family people who typically are in the, uh, in the company in the morning, but there's also like the night owls that are in the company in the evening, so suddenly those can still benefit from each other. We also have a few seniors who are now transitioning to a new um, um, step in their career, so they are no, no longer so, so active within, uh, in, in terms of coding, 
What they still can do is provide asynchronous feedback and input. Something that also was observed that um, there are a few teams that are very good at working um, remotely already. There are a few teams that are lagging behind. What helped was to bring those together, to make people remote aware, and to improve the technological support for that. However, what's important, being physically close to each other is still valuable. So we had one team, uh, they started collaborating across team boundaries for a couple of weeks. And there was something strange going on in the communication. They were like skeptical of the um, pull request reviews that were coming in. They were like trying to get into the flow. So what we suggested was, hey guys, just go out and have lunch together. So that is still valuable. Also, like when we do such retrospectives, we do have coaches that support them. They are still being done face to face, clearly. What we try to do, though, is to take these lessons and make them visible to the entire company for those interested. What we create with that is a sort of passive documentation baseline. It consists of everything that was discussed. Like if you've got a new team member, you mentor them, you try to mentor as much as possible in a written way, such that as soon as someone new is coming on, you can ref refer them to what was said already. Um, for coming back to my experience at the ASF, what happens there is you have a ba very noisy baseline of documentation. You still have like a structured website on top, but what happens occasionally is that here you've got emails that are very valuable to read. So what happens there is you don't write all of that up again, you just link to it and then you know where to read and you can find your way. So essentially this passive documentation is just a baseline. You still need some higher level um, tracking of what was said and done. So the goal here is to maintain a project memory. So even if people are coming and going, you still know where you're coming from and which decision was being made. Feedback we got from the um, written over verbal communication. So some of the teams in our company had been uh, had a shared goal of develop developing features in a pair programming way. What people observed, so comparing um, pair programming to the pull, re pull request model, was that so far the feedback that they got for pull requests was more detailed, more valuable. The explanations that I got from people was that when they do pairing, they are both in a state of mind where they want to fix the issue, where they want to move forward. However, those doing those reviews, what they told me was that they were in a state of mind where they are trying to break things, where they are trying to find flaws, which is a different way of thinking. So this helped uncover a several bugs that otherwise would have taken the platform down. And another kind of feedback that we got was that pull request uh, reviews encourages quality and knowledge, knowledge sharing. Suddenly what you do is not only visible to your pairing partner, but visible to everyone who can pot potentially do pull requests. So the way we've set it up is that the one authoring the pull request is the one uh, who's responsible for finding a reviewer. However, the code changes open and everyone is invited to provide feedback and a review. Also people were very, so far were happy with the feedback qualities that they got in reviews. This does entail a very scary thingy so. Now everything is open, everything is public to everyone, not just within team boundaries including the creation process of those features, including the errors that you make while creating those, um, those, those, this code. So this means that you have to be very error tolerant, very mistake tolerant. People will make mistakes before you just simply didn't see this. At Apache, there is a, a project called Solar, where there is a Yonix law of patches, a half-baked patch in Jira, 
no docs, no tests, no backwards compatibility, it's better than no patch at all. So this is not how typically features are being presented in a, a Scrum uh, review. There, the features that are being presented, they are done. Here you suddenly start sharing work in progress, including your mistakes and thinking how things should be done. So we've set up a additional principle, which is embrace mistakes. So make it okay so that people can make mistakes. We still have a challenge with that because in one of our retrospectives there was a little sticky note saying um, we want to encourage people to have the heart to contribute in team external projects. So if people are still afraid, it's not in everyone's head that mistakes are okay. Within any of those projects there is one role that is important, that's the trusted committers. A trusted committer essentially is the same as a committer, maintainer, or whatever your term is in open source. Typically what software engineers are being rewarded for is, is creating new features. If you have pull requests, you need, to re need someone to review them. You need someone to mentor new team members. And this, ha this is time that someone has to find. To find people to have that time, you need to reward them to put this effort in. It's the same that I see at the Apache Incubator with new open source projects coming out of companies. You suddenly have to set up a reward system such that pull requests or uh, patches coming in are being reviewed and feedback goes out. That's what the trusted committer is for. It's a special role um, for a person who sets aside time for reviewing, accepting pull requests, for mentoring people, and also for writing and maintaining the rules for contributing to the code base. Stuff that's typically not in your usual software engineering day-to-day -day work. So they, they, all, they also get time to participate on discussions lists, to send announcements, and to watch for and suggest, just suggest opportunities for collaboration. Because what I did when I was at Mahout, what I did as well was to coach new people in, to find people using the project and teach them how to get started. And you need such people within your project um, internally as well for that to work. Something that we set up as well was a principle to welcome all contributions, not only code contributions. So to set a very firm focus that it's not only coding that you need in order for uh, InnoSource to succeed. You need to reward um, people who submit source code, sure, but also documentation, bug reports, constructive discussion, participation, marketing, user support, UX design, operations, whatever, what have you. The so feedback we got, suddenly accountability is made, being made too transparent. Um, what it helps with trusted committership is to make roles and responsibilities transparent. Remember, like from most companies that I come from, the way it works is you have a team and that team has shared code ownership for all of their projects. Now suddenly you have some of those team members contributing to other code bases. So the mapping between this is my team and this is my code base doesn't work quite well anymore. So you can use trusted committers for those shared projects to make it explicit who on that team and who on that team is contributing here and is held accountable what's, for what's happening here. Some other feedbacks that we got was, well, every GitHub project needs code owners and code owners re are responsible for co uh, pull request reviews. Code owners internally at that team being essentially the equivalent to trusted committers. Another feedback that we got, we've got product owners who are not coding, but who provide valuable input to how features should be implemented because they have the link to the customer. So the feedback that we got was in our retrospective was, well, coder, product owners should be accountable for the issues that they bring to the projects themselves, giving them a path into the project also. In open source, who drives decisions? Those are the ones who decide who are doing the work. Um, the way I set up the InnoSource initiative at Europace was the following. 
we created a GitHub repo to collect documentation and to collect experiences on uh, how we were using InnoSource internally. At the beginning, it was just me like being responsible for that project. After half a year, there were like from each team that we had, one person who was interested in this InnoSource stuff and was kind of sort of driving it from his team's perspective. So what I said was, okay, for that project, gives the head of being a trusted committer to this person. I told them you get the head because you've been doing valuable work before. You don't have to do more afterwards. Things that happened was because they got this reward and recognition was that they were doing more. We observed the same thing with the coding project. We had one project cross, cross team. They started such that the team who held the code at first were the ones with write access to the repository were like trusted committers. When they had contributed enough, after a couple of days, maybe a week, they were uh, made trusted committers to this repository as well. What was interesting to observe after a year was that the feature request was done. And even months later, those who had come in were still participating. We're still reviewing and we're still approving pull requests. So there is a sort of uh, motivation that remains once people have that role. Something that was also done at Europace was to take collaboration with customers one step further. They are fairly UX driven, so they talk a lot with their customers. Um, they watch their customers, uh, how they are using the platform. Now they've got a long feature backlog. However, their customer, some of their customers, um, they do have development resources. So one of the teams made an experiment to let customers contribute the functionalities that they needed to the code base. Yes, it took a lot, a lot of mentorship and it took a lot of learning on both sides how this could work, but it did work out well. So the principles that we have internally is to encourage contributions over feature requests. Try to think about a way to set up your project such that people can contribute, that those contributing are being seen as potential future trusted committers that are taking work off your plate. And if you're approaching a team, be prepared to be asked to help out. So something that was seen as positive and as in one of the retrospectives was the cross-team collaboration that started. So they started um, collaborating across teams. They started collaborating with remote people, with external colleagues, um, with colleagues from other teams and companies. What they saw as well was that they got a broader input from colleagues that were not on the same team. They were solving some of the, say, operations questions in a different way, but those could learn from that, such that things weren't invented twice. So how do you continue from here, if that sounds interesting? You know, those comments doesn't only have like a manifesto or principles. They're working on a formal manifesto as we speak. What I find interesting about them is that they also started to develop a common pattern language. So things that worked in certain companies, they are writing that up in pattern form. What does that mean? You've got a document which states a problem, which states uh, what changes you make, and it states what the state will look like once you apply the solution. The funny thing is that you can contribute to this pattern collection as well, and that's what Europace did. Um, we've got a fairly strong DevOps culture. So in the one project that I described, where team A and team B were collaborating on the same um, code base, essentially this was a microservice and it was running right here. The environment of team A and team B for running microservices is fairly different. So the very first issues that they ran into is, hey, if there's an error, who gets the, um, he, who gets the alert? Hey, so this is being deployed in, in environment X, but we here only have ex experience with environment Y. How does that work? So the solution was to remember that this is about inner source and it, not about inner deployment. 
So essentially right now they extracted the common code into like a library, which is being deployed as two microservices that are independent from each other and that are being run by two independent teams. We took this experience because we saw it multiple times, wrote it up in a, um, as a pattern, service versus library, and submitted it to Innocence Commons. You can read it up right there. If you find more of those lessons, put them up as a pull request to Innocence Commons GitHub repo, and people will help you and merge it. What would be my suggestion on how to get started? Innosus, as I know it, is a pattern collection. It's not a either you take everything or you're not an Innosus kind of approach. So what you have to do is to understand your organization. You, what typically helps is to find both those who are allies and those who are um, blocking your ideas and figure out um, how those can help you and what the trouble is with these people over here. Work with them both in one-on-one -on -one, uh, one -on -one sessions as well as in larger rounds. In one-on-one -on -one sessions, you probably have an easier time for finding out what the fears are, what the culture are, what the prob people problems are. In larger rounds, you can have a better setup where people learn from each other. You start from where you are. Uh, you identify some of the challenges you want to solve, and you only move towards a solution or the rolling out a pattern after, you, uh, yeah, after you've identified the issues. What has helped in many companies is to start out with experiments. Like not say, we want to do inner source in our entire enterprise. Start with a tiny experiment, like kind of an isolated thingy where you've got a couple of engineers working together. Share the success story from there with everyone else and go from there. And start, start from there with scaling out. If you need inspiration, there's a couple books out there. From O'Reilly, there is the Understanding the Inner Source Checklist. There is a checklist at the end, but at the beginning, there is a quite nice explanation of how this trusted committer thingy works, of um, what the uh, big cheese story looks like, etc. There's also one book on adopting inner source case studies. One of the case studies comes from Europace, so you can see for yourself what we've been doing there. If you need a bit of a broader view, you can check out um, the open organization for Red Hat, which has more of a management perspective on the entire topic. If you want to go towards more of the inner source, uh, open source um, way, you can check out To Do Group from Linux Foundation, but there's also books on how to um, manage open source projects, which you can then take in order to translate to inner source. So some of the feedbacks that we've received. Hey, we're collaborating with professionals. Everyone's engaged, everyone's contributing, and yes, it was fun. So to summarize, key is to start with a problem. What helps is to lead by example. And what helps is to, is to have like one goalpost being to strive for transparency at the entire um, decision-making chain, and not only at the source code change to, um, part. For that, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, well, thank you for this talk. Um, yeah, other questions? Yeah, this one. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have uh, a question about the detail. It's not exactly about the talk itself. Uh, you mentioned the same thing in a different talk yesterday. Uh, the law, I forgot the name, but basically that a crappy patch with no test, with no documentation that breaks compatibility is better than no patch at all. Uh, those are the kind of patches that normally land you know, at the feet of, uh, of uh, project maintainers. How do we 
where do you go from there? Like, how do you deal with the usual situation when there is a patch and it will affect 90% of the user base, but it will solve the problem of the person who is, uh, you know, interested in uh, pushing it through? And there is no mechanism, essentially, to ask them to do more work. So either you have to do the work yourself as a maintainer, or you just uh, war knock them and you know and drop their patch on the floor. So this is about inner source. If there is something that that has to be done for so many users, and there is no user taking up that work, there is still a regular prioritization process, where the team itself does the work. So this is, yeah. So typically you wouldn't start with such a patch. Um, that's one of the discussions that we have internally right now where some of the people think that they just write stuff up, put it in the repository and then it goes out. The way I know it from open source, it's not quite how it works. You start a bit of communication beforehand. And that's what you have to get into people to understand them to understand that it's not about I write it up and magically it appears. You still have to do the prioritization roadmap thingy before, especially if it's big things. Like for small things, it's easier to get it in from the side. For large uh, patches that impact a lot of the customer base, there still has to be some kind of um, synchronization process. Something that we have observed right here is we, of course, had the synchronization process before already. Something that our observed was that if your proposal comes with a patch, it comes with a, with a patch, it's easier to discuss because it's more concrete. It doesn't have to be polished, it doesn't have to be ready and done, but it helps the discussion and to make it a little bit more concrete. Thank you. More questions? I don't see any. So, um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Thank you. <laughs>